Nainan. Thank you, sir. Next, we have a 45 minute session on what's new in heart lung interactions, in critically in ill neonates by Professor Patrick Mick Namara from University of Lowa, USA. As the moderator of the session, we have Professor Venkata Seshan Sundaram. Dr. Venkata Seshan Sundaram is a professor, Division of Neonatology, Department of Pediatrics at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Chandigarh. His areas of special interest are cardiovascular hemodynamics in severe sepsis, myocardial function assessment, and many more. He has several publications to his name and is a recipient of several awards, including the NNF Gold Medal for Best Research Paper in 2006. With much joy, we welcome you to the dais, sir, and also humbly request you to introduce the speaker for the session. Uh, thank you uh, for the nice introduction. A uh, very good morning to you all. Uh, Professor Patrick is there. He's online, I guess. Yeah, so Professor Patrick actually and uh, PGI has a very close association. Uh, maybe more than a decade actually because in 2008s and 9s when actually we all started learning actually functional echo and uh, hemodynamics assessment bedside so we had actually him for one of the workshops he came to pgi and a wonderful interaction and then we have been in close contact with him and his students are there all over the world and we all actually fortunate to learn from him uh, he was in uh, sikits toronto for many many years and over the last two years or so, actually, has moved to University of Iowa. He's a professor in uh, pediatrics, neonatology. Uh, he's uh, in charge, vice chair of the internal acute care division, actually, of, uh, of the internal medicine department. Uh, he's a, one of the pioneers in hemodynamics and in, uh, in neonatology. A lot of publications. If I keep talking, I think the whole day would end. And uh, many chapters and books, many recommendations, many guidelines actually has been a part of formulating the guidelines. We are really very fortunate to hear actually from him today about uh, a very important topic. Uh, why the topic is important? Because in neonatology, actually, I think um, interventions involved in the lung and interventions involved in the heart actually has been the most common intervention next to GA tract, which we heard a little while ago. Uh, second important thing actually is that there are two organs which actually are moving organs in the same compartment. Not any two organs are actually in the same compartment which are moving also, like the so lung as well as heart. The movement makes special interaction and uh, dynamic interaction which keeps on changing with all the interventions. So, Professor Patrick, uh, uh, it's all set. We are happy to hear from you. You can start. Okay, can you confirm you can see my slides and you can hear me okay? Yeah, we are able to see. Great. And you can hear me okay? Yeah, audio is okay, you can start. Wonderful, okay. So uh, thank you so much for the, the wonderful uh, introduction. It's, it's a real pleasure to be speaking to everyone and all my friends in India. I remember very fondly my uh, visit to Neocon in Ahmedabad. I believe it was around 2009 or so when I had a, a whirlwind tour of India and got to, to visit so many wonderful people and so many wonderful places. So um, what I'm going to talk about today over the next uh, 40 minutes or so um, is, um, as mentioned, a topic that we perhaps have not paid enough attention to. And we oftentimes have... Um, uh, consider the heart and the lung as separate organs and many of the symptoms and signs of acute or chronic instability, um, we compartmentalize them into a heart problem or a lung problem without necessarily appreciating the interaction between both of them. But before we start talking about um, uh, heart lung interactions, I just want to review a little bit about, you know, how and where have we evolved over the last uh, 30 years or so, and talk a little bit about the importance of precision in care, particularly with respect to cardiovascular care. As you can see from the graphs on front of you, we've made tremendous improvement in neonatal survival all across the gestational ages. Yet when we think about 
most of the problems we face in a day-to-day -day basis in the NICU. Blood pressure, the ductus arteriosus, uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, interventricular hemorrhage, it doesn't appear that we've made a lot of progress, which is kind of surprising. And I just listened to Joel's talk a lot about individualization of care and the importance of understanding mechanism and so forth. But neonatology is a, a field that was born in physiology. And from the 90s onwards, we recognize the importance of evidence, the importance of conducting carefully controlled trials. But when we think about the cardiovascular system, there's actually very little uh, in terms of major progress in how we manage our babies. So if we think about, you know, the simple and most important tenant, you know, what do we define as a healthy cardiovascular system? Well, we really don't seem to know or are not well able to differentiate normal from abnormal. This is a study conducted by one of my colleagues, Reagan Giesinger, who looked at 71 academic centers across North America and reported 17 different definitions used for hypotension. In many centers, not just in North America, but across the world, an algorithmic approach to the cardiovascular system continues to be used. And we continue to have this very obsessive focus on mean arterial pressure and have elevated this to being a disease rather than a symptom. So in that same survey that Reagan conducted, only 20% of centers actually performed echocardiography to try and physiologically characterize the nature of hypotension. And dopamine continues to be the most common therapy used in most centers for most indications. So both of these babies don't look well. They both look sick. Unlike um, patients who um, uh, are hypotensive, these babies actually had one on the left-hand side had high blood pressure. The baby on the right-hand side had normal blood pressure. So in many centers, how often do we consider in a normal tensive or a hypertensive patient that the cardiovascular system may be compromised? And when we think about the relationship between blood pressure and cardiac output, you can see it's a nonlinear relationship such that there are patients who are in a hypotensive state but may have preserved cardiac output. But more concerningly, there are babies who have a normal or high blood pressure that may be in a low cardiac output state. Now, we've recognized that blood pressure may not necessarily predict a low cardiac output state, but does recovery of low blood pressure, can we translate that to mean that the patient's problem has recovered? This was a 28-week infant who developed hypotension, blood pressure of 30 over 19, was treated with hydrocortisone, which made the blood pressure increase, but the lactate continued to rise. The image on the right-hand side is a RV three-chamber view. And what you can see here, and you don't need to be an echo expert, the right ventricle is profoundly dysfunctional. So this infant had subclinical evidence of impaired RV function with a low cardiac output state. And the administration of treatment specific to the care of heart function led to resolution of the problem. And I think this is an important consideration that in providing care, we may have symptoms that we use to guide us as to whether the patient is well or not well, but the underlying pathophysiology may be very different between patients. And we'll come back to this a little bit later on. So how do we move beyond the status quo? And unfortunately, we try to make something that is incredibly complex, simple. There's nothing simple about cardiovascular physiology. It's incredibly dynamic. Secondly, if we want to have an enhanced approach to care, it's important to focus on not just providing care, but providing the best care, which requires enhanced diagnostic and therapeutic precision. This is not rocket science. If we actually go back to over 600 years ago, this is uh, Philip Paracelsus, who was a Swiss physician and alchemist. And he reported that medicine is not only a science, but it's an art. It deals with the very processes of life, which must be first understood before they may guide it. 
I think that's a principle that will underpin pretty much everything that we're going to talk about today. So in moving forward, we need to go back. And it's important to recognize the reason we went to medical school was because, you know, we were interested in physiology, biology. It's incredibly important if we are to help neonatology continue to advance diagnostic precision and the provision of therapies specific to the underlying diagnosis really are the way forward. Yet, when I go across centers across North America and talk to neonatal trainees, almost universally they report in their fellowship training, there is very little cardiovascular training, education, outside of talking about blood pressure. So we need to improve. So to better understand heart-lung interaction, it's important first to recognize that the goal of care is to optimize cellular metabolism, which is ensuring that the balance between oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption has an adequate homeostasis. Oxygen delivery is dependent not only on adequate cardiac output, but having lungs that are well recruited. And if we change the paradigm from a cardiovascular perspective to the importance of tissue oxygenation, Heart rate, preload, afterload, and contractility are incredibly important determinants of cardiac output, yet are very difficult to identify clinically. So in thinking about the immature cardiovascular system, it's first important to recognize that it's distinctly different to the adult heart. It has less muscle. The sarcolemma are much more uh, scattered, poorly organized, and their contractility is much less efficient. As you can see from the image in the bottom right, the right and the left ventricular fibers are very interdependent. And unlike adults, we have shunts that have an important modulator role. But even more important is we think of the performance of the heart and how it responds to loading conditions. It also is very different. The graph on the right is the Frank Starling law. And what you can see across a normal range of filling pressures, the adult heart will augment its contractility. The immature neonatal or fetal heart is flat, meaning that giving lots and lots of volume to increase filling pressures doesn't lead to any increase in the efficiency of heart contractility and may actually cause other issues. At a low atrial filling pressure, contractility will be affected. So maintaining a normal filling pressure is important. More important, then the effect of preload is the effect of afterload. Afterload is what you do when you go to the gym. If you bench press or if you squat, you put a load on the muscle. If you look at the two graphs, you can see on the x-axis is wall stress, on the y-axis is contractility. The slope of the line for the newborn is much steeper, basically meaning that increases in afterload lead to a much more significant reduction in contractility to the immature heart. So let's look at our reality. And our reality is for the most part in most NICUs, in most countries across the world, we provide symptom-based care. Symptoms like hypotension may receive volume or pressors. Symptoms like oxygenation difficulty or respiratory acidosis may require changes to the ventilator, surfactant, nitric oxide, and so forth. But if we think about all of these symptoms, and we put them all together, and we think of a unifying pathophysiology, things like PDA, heart dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, pneumonia, or other forms of lung disease may all give these symptom complexes. And if we just think from a symptom-based approach, we're highly unlikely to move the needle forward. I mentioned earlier the importance of Evans, and Evans is incredibly important, but I feel we've perhaps the needle has moved too far to the other extreme in that we now find ourselves paralyzed by we must wait for the results of the randomized control trial and sometimes following them in a very evangelical manner without actually considering do we understand the disease, is the drug relevant, and so forth. And if we go back to the words of Dave Sackett, what is evidence-based medicine? It's the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of evidence in making decisions for the individual patients. And you've just heard Joe talk about individualization of the care. So in thinking about research, it's important to ask the question first, 
does the patient actually have the diagnosis that we think they do? Second, do we understand the mechanism? Thirdly, does the treatment make biological and pharmacological sense? And finally, how we interpret the results. My first interest in echocardiography and the importance of echo came as a neonatal registrar at the Royal Maternity Hospital in Belfast. Uh, it was mandated that we perform head scans. And at that point in time, there was really very little emphasis or interest in the cardiovascular system. And I was very much self-taught or like what we promote today as the way to train people. But I would say my epiphany or the first time I really realized the importance of having echo available and helping understand patients was as a registrar at Basildon Hospital in the United Kingdom. There was an infant who was three weeks old, who was having apneic spells and increasing respiratory distress. His chest x-ray showed some cardiomegaly. And my attending, who knew I had some skills of echo, asked me to take a look at the baby. When I put the probe on the chest, I was shocked. The doctor's was closed, but I saw this big black shadow around the heart. So I reached out to a gentleman by the name of Mike Rigby at the Brompton Hospital in London. And I told him the story and told him about this big black shadow that looked like a pericardial effusion. And he said, drain it. So I put a needle into the heart and drained 25 mils of TPN. Now, in the year 2022, we don't think twice about this. It's not a big surprise. In the year 1997, we knew very little about the association of PICC lines and pericardial tamponade. And if I did not have that skill on that day, this infant ultimately would probably have had a cardiac arrest and most likely would have died because nobody would have thought of needling the heart to exclude a pericardiosynthesis. So for this and many other reasons, between 2001 and 2010, we started to build the expert model of care, which is based on taking beyond blood pressure, recognizing that yes, newborns may have an increased risk of congenital heart disease, but more importantly, cardiovascular physiology is complex. And to provide the best care, we need to provide an individual approach to treatment. This led to the publication of the guidelines for targeted neonatal echo in 2011, which were based on two principles. The principle of competence, that individuals need to be trained to perform high quality imaging. And secondly, logic and reason, that the information should only be used in the context of the clinical scenario. Over time, this has now led to the expert hemodynamics consultation where a trained clinician who has performed extensive training utilizes comprehensive and standardized echo in a very organized way to better understand physiology, formulate an impression and a diagnostic recommendation for care. In 2018, I moved to the University of Iowa and Iowa is an incredible place. If you look at the graph, you can see our survival rates for infants uh, at the limits of viability between 22 and 25 weeks gestation far supersede any other center across the Vermont Oxford network with survival rates up to 60% at 22 weeks gestation and close to 80% at 23 weeks gestation. Yet some babies continue to have problems. How can we move the needle even further? Well, our program has grown. We now have five faculty. We perform more than 1500 consults per year and have a one year integrated hemodynamics fellowship. One of the first things we did was to recognize that if we were to provide the optimal care for extremely preterm babies during the transitional period, it's important to recognize that our symptoms are imprecise and there may be subclinical evidence of uh, cardiovascular physiology. So based on an early screening echo, we performed treatment or phenotype specific approach to care. Babies with progressive PDA shunts got intravenous Tylenol, babies with pulmonary hypertension got low dose nitric oxide and so forth. What we've learned over the last four years is that up to 60% of babies will have subclinical evidence of abnormal cardiovascular physiology. And that doesn't really differ between infants born between 22 and 23 or 24 and 26 weeks. The most common problem in the transitional period was the presence of a hemodynamically significant PDA. 
I don't have time to go into all of the details, but I just wanted to share this with you before we talk about heart-lung interactions to really emphasize the importance of having precise information. So we just reported at PAS data from 600 babies over the last 10 years. And despite the fact that in the modern epoch in which we started hemodynamic screening, there were more babies born at 22 and 23 weeks, that these infants were born to mothers uh, who were more likely to have obesity, substance abuse, uh, SSRI use. The babies were born by breech presentation. Despite all these disadvantages, the composite outcome of death or severe IVH, death in the first week, severe IVH, severe grade three BPD, and necrotized enterocolitis were significantly lower in the modern epoch. And after adjusting for these adverse risk factors and protective factors, such as we're doing more delayed core clamping, hemodynamic screening was associated with an improvement in survival free of severe IVH with an odds ratio of 3.5, really emphasizing the importance of having the right information. So how do we take these principles to heart-lung interaction? And I think there are two things that are first important to recognize is that one, what are the hemodynamic impact of respiratory interventions? And then secondly, what are the respiratory consequences of heart disease? Well, I think the first thing we need to recognize, and I mentioned this earlier, is that we have this habit of compartmentalizing symptoms, such that low blood pressure, tachycardia, decreased urinary output we consider as heart symptoms, hypoxia, increased CO2, increased respiratory rate, we consider them to be lung symptoms. So when your blood gas shows that the CO2 is elevated, what do most people do? They rush to change the ventilator. We need to increase the rate. We need to increase the mean airway pressure. However, the causes of hypercapnia don't just relate to optimal lung recruitment or tidal volume. If your right ventricle is not contracting and there's very little pulmonary blood flow, you will have hypercapnia. So it's incredibly important to actually move beyond this compartmentalizing of symptoms. I first recognized really the magnitude of the impact of um, uh, mechanical ventilation on the cardiovascular system with an infant who was born at 27 weeks gestation uh, at a peripheral hospital at Niagara Falls. And I won't forget it, I was a young faculty. This baby was sent to me on a weekend. The infant had a PO2 of 12, the oxygenation index of 50, and reportedly had a chest x-ray, which was normally recruited. And as oftentimes are done, infants who are thought to have pulmonary hypertension, nitric oxide and the oscillator wheeled out like husband and wife. When I went to echo this baby, I was struck by the fact that um, I could barely see the left ventricle. And when I looked at flow in the pulmonary veins, it was almost non-existent. So I asked the respiratory therapist to come and to actually take the baby off the oscillator and to start handbagging the baby. And when I did that, almost immediately, you could see flow in the pulmonary veins and the left heart started to fill. Recently, we had a term infant sent to us from a community hospital. The baby had received one dose of surfactant, had a large subsequent pneumothorax for which a chest strain was placed. And the baby was transferred to us because of progressive hypoxemia. The team started him on nitric oxide, but there was really uh, very little benefit. This was the image that we saw uh, when the baby um, came to us. And the fellow immediately reached out to her faculty, Reagan Giesinger, because she's noticed that this very odd phenomenon, which I cannot see the right atrium. So the faculty said, okay, have you actually um, uh, done a chest x-ray on this baby? And when she did the chest x-ray on the baby, you can see this huge reaccumulation of the pneumothorax. And what you see here is the actual atrium collapsing into the ventricle because the magnitude of the pressure was so high in the lung. 
So they drain the pneumothorax and now you can see the heart immediately after draining the pneumothorax, you now see a right atrium that is completely filled. So this is a very dramatic representation of the impact of mechanical ventilation on the cardiovascular system, but this can happen. Our understanding of the impact of breathing on the cardiovascular system was first described by Stephen Hales in 1733, an English clergyman who also was a physicist. And in a study on an equine model where he placed a catheter in the crural artery, Stephen demonstrated that during inspiration, blood pressure fell. Our understanding of the impact of mechanical ventilation on heart-lung interactions has expanded significantly over the last 300 years. And we now recognize it's a complex interplay between mean airway pressure, tidal volume, PO2, PCO2, visoreactivity, and heart function. But for the purpose of today, I really want to focus on two or three things. First, what is the impact of mechanical ventilation on systemic venous return? Well, what we know is that systemic venous return is dependent on a pressure gradient between the extra thoracic vessels and the right atrium. And such that during normal spontaneous breathing, as the diaphragm collapses, abdominal pressure will rise and pleural pressure will fall, leading to normal passive blood return into the right atrium. However, during mechanical ventilation, the increase in intrathoracic pressure will lead to an increase in pleural pressure, which will actually decrease the gradient between the extra thoracic pressure and the right atrium. And then the administration of PEEP will then further prevent airway pressure returning to atmospheric pressure levels. Now, where is this relevant? Well, this is going to be most relevant in patients in which preload is important. So infants who have right ventricular dysfunction or a preload dependent circulation, such as the Fontan circulation or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are very, very dependent on preload. So we need to be cautious with how mechanical ventilation impacts systemic venous return. But what we don't pay much attention to and actually there's very little research on is the impact of intrathoracic pressure on the pulmonary veins and on left atrial preload, but more importantly, on pulmonary venous congestion. Secondly, the impact of mechanical ventilation on pulmonary vascular resistance. The graph in front of you shows on the y-axis pulmonary vascular resistance. And what you can see is that there is an opt sweet spot in which at optimal FRC, pulmonary vascular resistance is at its lowest. However, if the patient becomes under-recruited, PVR will be elevated. If the patient becomes over-recruited and is hyperinflated, pulmonary vascular resistance will also be elevated. And again, this is particularly important if you elevate PVR because of mechanical ventilation, diseases like pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular dysfunction, you're going to increase the afterload to the right ventricle and potentially lead to more RV dysfunction. There are, however, situations in which an augmentation in PVR may be beneficial, managing the physiology of high volume PDA shunts or cardiac patients with single ventricle physiology. Thirdly, I think it's also important to recognize that mechanical ventilation initiates a pro-inflammatory cascade. And this may be most relevant in the delivery room. And this has been pointed out by Graham Polglaze and the group in Australia, who demonstrated that during the immediate transitional period after birth, where there are major changes in systemic blood flow, adaptive changes in the cardiovascular system, excessive mechanical ventilation leading to a significant inflammatory cascade may further add to compromise uh, flow to the brain and white matter injury. So we've talked that not all heart disease is of heart origin. Well, what about lung disease? This is always of lung origin. In 2003-04, I was asked to develop a process in Toronto for triaging babies for PDA ligation. And one of the things that I learned over the next four to five years is that after PDA surgery, babies get sick. 
their left ventricle fails, they develop a low cardiac output state, and they end up with a chest X-ray that looks very edematous and very sick. And over the next five to 10 years, we characterized the physiology and demonstrated that this relates to increased LV afterload, and that a drug like milorinone decreases the risk of post-ligation cardiac syndrome. But we're now in an era where we're doing less surgery and we're sending babies to the cath lab for PDA closure. Is this more benign? This is the baby recently in our center who went to the cath lab for PDA closure. After intervention, you can see that the lungs look clear. His ventilation is low, one hour. However, the baby, based on our PDA surgery criteria, met criteria for milrinone, which was started. Despite the addition of milrinone, the baby developed progressive oxygenation and ventilation failure, which you can see is very different from the previous chest X-ray. But during that same interval, the patient was noted to be very hypertensive. So the clinical team increased the milrinone to manage the hypertension. And you can see by 24 hours, with recovery of his blood pressure to a normal level, his chest X-ray improved. So is this lung disease, or actually is this a lung problem that is due to a heart problem? Well, we know that after PDA closure, preload decreases to the left heart, but systemic vascular resistance, and more importantly, left ventricular end diastolic pressure increases. And the increase in end diastolic pressure leads to increase in atrial pressure leading to pulmonary edema and provides a biological rationale for the deterioration in lung disease that we see. Adrian Bischoff at the University of Iowa just reported in a cohort of 50 babies that many babies indeed do get a worsening in oxygenation, as you can see in the top graph, and an increase in respiratory severity score. And using comprehensive advanced echo measurements, Adrian demonstrated that after PDA cath closure, these babies develop an increase in arterial elastance and end systolic elastance that was associated with impaired indices of left ventricular diastolic function. Now, I'm not an expert on lung ultrasounds, but this case was recently shared with me by Marilena Savoya, who just reported a case series of infants uh, after going PDA closure. And what you can see in their preoperative state, there is something called coalesced beelines, and this is pathognomonic of pulmonary edema. One hour after PDA closure, you see the appearance of these A-lines, which is consistent with resolution of the edema. However, by eight hours, you can see that there's a loss of the A-lines, and the picture, again, develops pulmonary edema, further providing evidence that this phenomenon that we're seeing after PDA closure is truly lung edema related to increased LV and diastolic pressure. Finally, I want to talk about one probably more controversial issue, which, you know, is BPD an exclusive lung problem? Well, BPD is something that we have elevated to be a very important endpoint in neonatology. We've searched for the magic bullet and we failed. The instance of BPD has remained fairly static and actually a recent study from the NICHD Neonatal Research Network actually shows in the last 10 years, the BPD rates are higher. So as a hemodynamics clinician, how do we think about BPD? Well, the first thing we recognize is it's very complex. There are many, many determinants of this illness, some of which may be cardiovascular. Secondly, we actually question the purity of this as an isolated respiratory disease. And thirdly, it's important to recognize that infants with BPD have a higher than normal risk of chronic pulmonary hypertension, cardiovascular maldevelopment. So if we think of the determinants of abnormal lung, parenchymal and vascular development, it's incredibly complex. There are antipartum factors, there are delivery related factors, and there are postnatal factors, some of which you've already heard about today, that influence both abnormal lung parenchyma and lung vascular development. Traditionally, our assumption is that the lung parenchymal dysregulation occurs first and the vascular occurs second. 
That may not necessarily be true. But more importantly, if we think about BPD as a diagnosis, it's actually not really a diagnosis. How we define it, and this is Eric Jensen's very good criteria, but they still define it, not as a disease, but by the receipt of therapy. If you need oxygen, if you need CPAP, if you need mechanical ventilation, you have BPD. This is the receipt of therapy. And even more importantly, as I mentioned previously, we have elevated BPD to be a very important endpoint. We use it to adjudicate whether treatments are successful or not, or relevant or not. So then it would be very important to be sure that this is a precise definition. And as I mentioned previously, it's a symptom-based definition. Secondly, if we're going to use it to adjudicate therapies, it's important to recognize that these therapies must be biologically plausible, targeted to a population at risk, and the treatments are clinically effective. Is this true? Well, if we think of the most controversial cardiovascular problem that's been associated with BPD, the ductus arteriosus, we've known now for 70 years that PDA is associated with pulmonary hypertension. And if we think of the physiology of a ductus, increasing left to right flow, if it's of sufficient magnitude and prolonged duration through both excessive pulmonary blood flow and increased PO2 theoretically leads to intimal and medial wall hypertrophy, which increases the risk of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Yet when we look at our trials, they actually don't show any benefit to BPD. And this has led to a secular movement away from PDA therapy. However, going back to evidence, have we done trials based on defining the problem? No. Have we a true control population? No. Are the medical therapies we use universally effective? Probably only in 50%. So it's highly questionable. And this is where we have to be very, very careful in actually using BPD to adjudicate interventions if the interventions are not targeted to the right patients. What's even more important, I would say, is actually what happens when you stop treating the PDA. This is some data from a center in Montreal, in which in 2013, they completely stopped treating every PDAs. And what they found was a 31% increase in the instance of BPD over the next 10 years. Never in the history of neonatology have we seen things getting worse. I think this is very important data. Now that we send babies to the cath lab, we're actually getting much more physiologic information on the impact of chronic shunts. So work from Sat Sham Satanandan in Memphis, where they have a large cohort of infants that go to the cath lab, demonstrates very clearly the infants who have PDA interventional closure at the latest time point, meaning more than eight weeks, have much higher pulmonary vascular resistance. We just reported this uh, observational study uh, at the PAS meeting. So taking the same center in Montreal, center A, in which they provide non-intervention approach to the PDA and comparing to a center that provides early intervention, you can see that in the non-interventional center, the risk of need for postnatal steroids is almost two times higher. The risk of a diagnosis of chronic pulmonary hypertension was also two times higher and after adjusting for gestational age and sex, non-interventional approach to PDA was associated with an increased odds of chronic pulmonary hypertension. So is chronic pulmonary hypertension perhaps a better differentiator of this patient population with lung disease? Well, certainly infants with chronic pulmonary hypertension are more likely to die, and they're more likely to be much sicker with need for tracheostomy, hospital readmission, and so forth. However, the instance is variable, ranging from 10% to 60% across centers, which may reflect a true variance in incidence, but may also reflect a detection bias because not everybody yet is yet ready to believe that we should be screening for chronic pulmonary hypertension. So if we think about the importance of screening, there are really three or four questions. What's the value? Are the methods reliable? Are the screening thresholds appropriate? and how precise are the diagnostic methods. This is a recent survey comparing 37 centers in the Canadian Neonatal Network 
and the Neonatal Research Network in the US. 57% of centers screen for chronic pulmonary hypertension, but in most centers, the assessment is subjective, and that may be very important. Only 70% perform right heart catheterization, but up to 86% reported use of pulmonary vasodilators. So let's ask those questions. Is it of value? Well, if we look at these two babies here, the baby on the left was a 24-weeker who at 36 weeks has grade 2 BPD on CPAP with 30% oxygen. The baby on the right was a 22-weeker with grade 3 BPD who was on mechanical ventilation. Yet, when we look at their screening echo, the baby who you expect to have a higher risk of chronic pulmonary hypertension does not. It was actually the, the, the less sick baby who had pulmonary hypertension. And this has been reported by Arjun Zidane, who actually demonstrated that yes, more severe BPD is more likely to develop chronic pulmonary hypertension, but it's not an absolute. There are babies with no BPD or mild BPD that still have a significant risk of chronic pulmonary hypertension. How reliable is subjective assessment? As I mentioned previously, that's what most people do. It's not very reliable. This is a study we published about four years ago where we asked six experts to look at 60 echoes, 30 from healthy babies, 30 from babies with pulmonary hypertension. And you can see that the kappa coefficient for subjective assessment of RV dilation, septal flattening, and RV dysfunction is almost universally very poor. Is objective quantitative better? Yes, it's better, but it's not perfect. The images in front of you were taken at 15 minutes apart. B and D reflect the optimal images. A and C were images that were intentionally taken incorrectly. And the reason we did this was to show that if the image acquisition is not good, the measurement error may be as high as 30% for RV area. And look here at the eccentricity index, which is an objective measure of septal flattening, almost two times higher. So again, the importance of correct and accurate image acquisition. Is 36 weeks the right time? Well, if we say yes to that, we're actually condemning the 22-weeker to wait much longer. Who has the higher risk of chronic pulmonary hypertension? Probably the 22-weeker. So if we choose an arbitrary threshold of 36 weeks, that infant has to wait 98 days. So for that reason at our center, we will screen babies at eight weeks or 36 weeks, whichever comes first. Finally, how precise is the definition of BPD? Well, if you look at these three cases, which are real cases, all at 36 weeks, all on CPAP in about 30 to 40% oxygen, subjectively, the right ventricle does look dilated and the septum looks flat. The baby on the left actually has got a large left to right atrial shunt. The baby in the middle actually has got pulmonary vein stenosis. The baby on the right has got pulmonary arterial hypertension. So for what looks like a same disease, meaning BPD with pulmonary hypertension, the physiologies are very different. And it may even be more complicated for some other babies. This is an infant born at 22 weeks with severe BPD who did not respond to most of the therapies we use for lung disease. We were asked to see him on day 102. The baby's lungs look terrible. The baby's on NAVA with a very high PEEP in 80% oxygen. And we noted him to be hypertensive. This is the echocardiogram. If you look at the top right image, this shows notching, uh, in his pulmonary artery Doppler, which is a sign of elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. However, if you look at the image on the left, what you can see is that the left heart is very dilated and the indices of left ventricular diastolic dysfunction were uniformly abnormal. So we made a diagnosis of elevated PVR in the setting of diastolic heart failure with preserved ejection fraction we recommended that they monitor the systemic blood pressure closely, and we started him on an enalapril to decrease his systemic blood pressure and to help with left heart function. Our understanding of the relationship between systemic hypertension and heart and lung maladaptation is really at its infancy. Some work recently conducted by Amy Stanford and Melanie Reyes at the University of 
Iowa provide some insights. They looked at a cohort of infants with BPD and elevated pulmonary vascular disease. And what they demonstrated was that the hypertensive babies were more likely, as you can see in the graph here, to have higher arterial elastins, abnormal indices of left heart diastolic function, and increase in volume loading to the left heart. In a subsequent study, we looked at the impact of an allopril in a small cohort of infants and demonstrated the temporal improvement in left heart compliance, diastolic function, and volume loading that parallels the improvement in systemic blood pressure and respiratory support. So going back to the baby you just saw, what happened after we gave him an allopril, you can see his chest x-ray improved remarkably, his blood pressure fell, and his respiratory support improved significantly over the next few weeks. So it's important to recognize that when we're thinking of BPD and pulmonary hypertension, we got to go back to physiology. Pressure is the product of flow times resistance and left atrial pressure. To date, we have exclusively focused on chronic pulmonary hypertension and its relationship to resistance. But in the cases you've just seen, the determinants of pressure may be atrial level shunt, pulmonary vein disease, or left heart phenotype, all of which require a unique approach to care. Finally, this is highly relevant as we move forward in neonatology. We've started to learn that preterm babies are growing up to be adults with a 17-fold increased risk of heart failure, an increased risk of ischemic heart disease, and also pulmonary hypertension. We've learned that adults born preterm have ventricles that are smaller, stiffer, and got myocardial fibrosis. Yet, when we think about the gap between the NICU and adulthood, we have really no idea as to the neonatal and environment model, environmental modulators of cardiovascular or pulmonary remodeling. So in building the bridge to adulthood, how do we move forward? Well, we must recognize that prematurity is a state of being and not a disease. It's important to characterize the natural history of heart and vascular development, not just in sick babies, but also in well babies, determine the modulators of maldevelopment, and look at the impact of both neonatal and beyond neonatal interventions. Tools like MRI in the NICU will help us better understand heart and lung development. Artificial intelligence will provide much better insights into when babies get sick. So in conclusion, a symptom-based approach to care is imprecise and leads to therapeutic non-judiciousness. Whether it's the heart or whether it's the lung, to select the right drug or right intervention at the right time requires a high level of understanding of disease, characterizing the ambient physiology, and understanding how drugs work. With respect to heart-lung interaction, it's important to better characterize the modulators of abnormal cardiovascular and respiratory maldevelopment and how they relate to each other. And the growth of neonatal hemodynamics as a subspecialty offers great hope for the future. So I'd like to thank members of the Iowa hemodynamics team, all the nurses and all the wonderful people in our program to help provide such exceptional care to our babies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Patrick, for the really exhaustive coverage of uh, hemodynamics in general and cardiovascular hemodynamics in particular and the impact of lung and heart and heart on the lung. Uh, I think for the audience sake, actually, I thought that uh, the key points which we could got is one is a terminology would use very nice hemodynamics clinician, which is an important take home message. I think actually many of us work in hemodynamics, so unclinical neonatologist, that's a new term for us. Uh, you told us actually that uh, as in the last slide, the first point is that don't treat the symptom complex, look at the underlying pathophysiology, look at the whole spectrum, understand the whole uh, process and then manage. That's a very important key point. And you give multiple examples that where many lung diseases like BPD and many other problems has a cardiac origin. And uh, with the cardiac problems, let it be acute problems or a chronic problems that has a lung involvement. You showed some examples of pneumothorax creating a problem in acute setting. You showed an example of an earlier days of an ATPN induced effusion causing actually a cardiac problems. So very wonderful examples. I'm sure all the audience would take home those these messages. Uh, I would 
open the talk for uh, questions and comments from the audience. I'm sure a lot of questions and comments. Uh, I just have one or two questions before to start with. <clears throat> In uh, LMIC countries, no developing countries, small for date is a big problem. Like say, if you look at our own place, around 30-40% new bonds born there are, IUGR, small for date new nets. Uh, and there are data coming in actually on small for date new, uh, new bonds, whether it be a BPD as an incidence, whether it be actually cardiovascular function, right ventricular function, pulmonary artery, hypertension and all. So what is the current actually evidence on this? small for date newborns and uh, the small for date newborns also have polycythemia as a very common problem because nearly 40 50 percent of the newborns at least in our center they actually have uh, polycythemia a higher hem hematocrit and uh, which can lead to sort of vascular stasis and can increase the pulmonary artery pressures and can create problem in the management so that's one question from my side we can look for a response and we can take us from the audience then. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's a great question. I think, you know, the, the infant who is born growth retarded has, as you have correctly appreciated, suffered chronic intrauterine hypoxia ischemia, potentially due to placental maladaptation or uh, other factors. And what we, what we know from a cardiovascular perspective is that these babies, they don't have a single phenotype. So you're hearing this over and over again. You know, I think the, the main message I wanted to share with people today, a little bit of shock and awe tactics that we're dealing with something very complex and you can't make it easy and you can't guess it. And to provide, you know, uh, the highest level of care, it's important to recognize these distinct differences. So within the IUGR patient population, there are also different phenotypes that we've seen. There are some infants that present with a kind of a classic pulmonary vascular disease that can present very early in which it's really important to recognize uh, the potential benefits of early pulmonary vasodilators and so forth. But then there's a second phenotype that present with um, kind of abnormal left heart development that may present like some of the cases I presented there at the end, they present with more of a pulmonary venous or post capillary phenotype in which pulmonary vasodilators actually will be very harmful in that situation. And the approach should be to optimize left heart function. And in other infants, prolonged exposure to kind of left to right PDA shunts, which if left untreated, may lead to then a late secondary pulmonary hypertension. And again, we've seen all of these different phenotypes present in very, very different ways. And I think, you know, the, I think the key thing is to, to recognize that what might look as a, a similar clinical presentation, meaning respiratory deterioration, a problem with your blood pressure could have many different reasons for that. And neonatology has to embrace this. And to embrace this, we need to have individuals in the NICU that can perform comprehensive and standardized echocardiography. And I think the, you know, the, you spoke about the hemodynamics clinician, and that's what we talk about now. We don't talk about targeted neonatal echo. We talk about the hemodynamics clinician, an individual who has received extensive training, not just in echo, but in cardiovascular physiology, pharmacotherapeutics, who has a lot of exposure to seeing lots of sick babies. They have a unique expertise. And this, this has formed the basis for our one-year post-fellowship kind of subspecialty year. Dr. Patrick, good morning. Thoroughly enjoyed your uh, work and lecture. Just a small query from our side. You talked about uh, post-device closure pulmonary edema occurring in uh, neonates who underwent a device closure. Does it also not occur following medical closure? Or is it the medical closure is so gradual that your pulmonary edema is not seen so often, but we see it often with your abrupt device closure? Thank you. 
that's a great that's a great question. Um, nobody has reported post medical closure um, edema. I believe the reason that we see it after device closure is that the infants undergoing PDA closure, interventional or surgical, have a more prolonged shunt. So their kidneys have been theoretically exposed to chronic hypoperfusion. So you have an upregulation of the renin angiotensin system. So when you then eliminate the ductus, you have a much higher level of circulating angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2. So you develop this post-closure hypertension. If you, if you look at the medical babies who have early treatment in the first one to two weeks, typically when the ductus closes, the blood pressure normalizes. It doesn't, it doesn't increase. So it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating question. Um, we have not noticed it. That doesn't mean that it's not possible. It, you know, if, if the P, we don't know when we give medical therapy, does the PDA close in two hours or does it close in three days? Because we typically give a course of therapy and we don't check in between. So it's, 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 it's biologically possible, but certainly um, I think the main message I wanted to share with you is that when you close these babies with device, it's not completely benign and the respiratory deterioration is most likely to be related to this systemic hypertension. And you need to treat the hypertension, not keep increasing the ventilator. Uh, there's one more question. Patrick, uh, Sony from uh, Sidra Medicine, Qatar. Uh, we only do the device uh, closure of the PDA, not surgical ligation. Um, and uh, yearly, uh, I think about uh, six to seven, sometimes eight uh, device closures happens uh, across the Qatar, not just in our hospital. All the babies come to our hospital for device closure. The observation is we have not seen as much uh, post-device closure uh, uh, post uh, syndrome compared to when I was working in UK where uh, post-surgical ligation, there were uh, more uh, such syndromes. And my observation and talking to the cardiologist there is but the device does not close the uh, uh, PDA completely. There's some residual shunt is there which takes about 8 to 12 hours or even up to 24 hours before duct fully closes. So there is a bit of a gradualness here as well compared to what was described earlier in the medical. What is your observation of, uh, about the device closure in your unit compared yeah. to surgical ligation? I think I think that it, it, it's, it's a great question. The one thing I can tell you for sure is unlike the babies who went undergo PDS surgery, the dramatic post ligation cardiac syndrome with a lot of hypotension, a lot of instability, we, we don't see that. Um, the case I presented in question is the most likely phenotype we see, this hypertension with this progressive respiratory deterioration. I think the key question, just like in PDS surgery, is how old is the baby when you're doing the intervention? And if you're closing the duct at three months, the afterload to the right ventricle is already high because of chronic PDA, pulmonary vascular resistance and so forth. So those babies tend to not get sick from that perspective. Um, but if you're closing the PDA early in a very tiny baby, and again, most of our babies that we close are 22, 23 weekers that are probably two to three weeks old. So they fall into that kind of much more vulnerable period, you know. And again, you know, our, our ethos from a PDA perspective is that if you have a bad shunt, and again, we're very selective in who we treat, the earlier you eliminate it, the better. So we don't like to leave babies with shunts for more than probably three to four weeks maximum. And I think the big, the big plus for us is that our rates of chronic pulmonary hypertension, even though we have 60% survival at 22 weeks, 80% to 23 weeks, our chronic pulmonary hypertension rate is less than 5%. And I believe it's because we're not leaving babies exposed to bad shunts for a very long period of time, causing pulmonary vascular remodeling and so forth. So I've kind of answered your question in a roundabout way, but we've seen the same thing that if, if you're doing a very late closure, you don't get much 
instability. And if you're, I, I, would, I would recommend that you look at early closures in the first month versus beyond the first month and look at the respiratory course afterwards and you probably see that there are some differences there, you know, so. Thank you. So uh, before closing, I should ask one small question, Patrick. Um, yeah. In pediatric practice, if you go to the PICU, intensive care unit pediatrics, they look at the intra-abdominal pressure very commonly. So like many centers in India, they do actually follow the intra-abdominal pressure because higher pressure in the intra-abdominal area can compromise the lung inflation and then can eventually compromise the cardiac output. Uh, premature newborns tend to have like NEC, abdominal distension or feed intolerance, tend to have a distant abdomen. Um, but we don't see much of uh, centers looking at intra-abdominal pressure or trying to bring down the intra-abdominal pressure to make the lung ventilation effective and cardiac output effective. What is your take on this? Yeah, it's a it's, um, it's very interesting concept. And I, I'm, I equally am not aware of any center that is monitoring abdominal pressure. All, all I can share with you in my personal practice over the years, um, uh, absolutely, uh, the compartment syndrome that you can get with neck or other causes of severe elevations and in intra-abdominal pressure can have a huge impact on mechanical ventilation. And you know, if you have an infant who um, you have an intestinal problem that is forcing you to keep increasing the mechanical ventilator to counteract elevations in abdominal pressure. Uh, decompressing the abdomen is one of the things that we do by placing it in a drain or decompressing the intestine. Um, certainly, we've also seen that that has a huge impact on the cardiovascular system and may also impact, you know, afterload to the left ventricle, preload to the heart and so forth. So absolutely, you're absolutely right. There are things going on there that are really important. Uh, but outside of our eyes and hands assessing, that's about it that we do at, at this point in time. And it's, it's, it's very, very uh, non-scientific, but there are definitely babies that you have to decompress the abdomen. That's all I would say. Thank you once again. Thanks for the really wonderful lecture. I think no more questions, so we should call an end to this talk. Thank you once again, uh, Patrick, to be with us. Thank you. You're very Thank you, Dr. Patrick, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and for sharing your views on the topic. We extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Venkatesha Sundaram for his contributions to the session.